Hello, I'm Martin van Exter. I'd like to tell you about the magic of interference. The magic of interference in a 5 Perot interferometer. This is a typical 5 Perot interferometer uh, a tube uh, which contains a mirror on the front, a mirror on the back, and in this case, even a detecting element. But uh, the magic is in what happens to the light between these two mirrors. So let's sketch it. Suppose you have two mirrors that each reflect 99% of the light. 99% of the light is reflected and only 1% of the light is transmitted. For a single mirror, now you have two. So the question is, what happens, how much light do you get out of this system of two mirrors? Naively, on first reaction you would say, well, I mean, probably 1% out of 1%, because the second mirror also transmits only 1%. So that's 10 minus 4. But then what you forgot is that this 99% that gets internally reflected bounces up and down and up and down and up and down and get many possibilities to be transmitted through the second mirror. So on second thought, you might say, well, if this light bounces up and down, then ha half of the time it emits, it gets transmitted through the left mirror, half of the time through the right mirror. So maybe you just get half of 1%, which is like 0.5%. Even that answer is not correct. Because what you forgot is that the light actually is a wave. We have a wave coming into the system, and there are waves wiggling up and down between the two mirrors. And so the waves, the two waves, they interfere. And these multiple possibilities that the wave gets transmitted, they all add up uh, either constructively or destructively, depending on the distance between the mirrors. So what happens in practice? If you have a wave coming in, and if these mirrors are such that the wavelength fits between the mirrors, actually uh, the length of the cavity is a multiple of half the wavelengths, such that you get a standing wave in between these mirrors, then if the thing really fits, what you'll see is that 100% of the light gets transmitted. No light gets reflected and actually internally in this cavity the intensity is 100 times larger than the incident intensity. If the incident intensity is I0, <coughs> then internally you have 100 I0 propagating to the right and actually also 100 I0 propagating through the left. So that uh, what gets transmitted through the final mirror is only I0. That's the magic of interference. So how, how can we show this magic of interference mathematically? Uh, for that, we'll first consider one mirror with 1% transmission, 99% reflection, and write uh, the transmission this 1% as an amplitude. We are dealing with wave interference, so we have to think in terms of amplitudes of waves that add up. So, transmission, intensity transmission, 1%, means reflection, 99%. And again, that's an intensity reflection, so the amplitude of reflection is the square root of 99, which is 0 0.995, approximately. So this is one thing we have to consider, amplitudes. And the other thing we have to consider is when you have an input field, I n, and here an internal field, t times I n, then what you get out you get another factor t for the transmission, so you get t squared 
I can. But there is also a phase vector because the light propagates in the cavity and thus acquires a phase. And for the phase vector, uh, we'll introduce the concept of round trip phase. The round trip phase is the phase acquired by the light during a round trip. And the round trip takes a length to L, which you have to compare with the wavelength of light. And then, of course, in a single wavelength, you get 2 pi phase. So this is the round trip phase. And then looking back at this first transmission, that's only half a round trip. So that phase that you acquire is phi over 2. And this is the first trial of the light to get out of the system, out of the fibro. But the light gets more trials because, like I said, you have round trips. So the next trial you get is uh, you go that way, then you go this way, then you go this way. And on each round trip, uh, you get a factor, an additional factor, which is related to this reflection here, this reflection here, and the round trip. So in total, you get a factor r squared i phi. You get that factor on the first round trip, you get an additional factor on the second round trip, so you get some factor to the power n. So let's add this all up and look at the output field relative to the input field. The first trial, as explained, you get this factor t squared e to the power of phi, i phi over 2. That's the first trial. But then the light makes a round trip. In the round trip, it acquires a factor r squared e phi. So the second trial of the light has an amplitude which is slightly less, less by a factor r, small r squared, so capital R. 0.99 in our case, and there is a phase factor because of the round trip. And then if you go make another round, you get this factor, to the squared, and then to the third, etc. So mathematically, the challenge is to add these things up, and you might recognize here the series 1 plus x plus x squared plus x to the third, etc. And you might also recognize that if you add these things up, you can rewrite them as 1 divided by 1 minus x. So you might recognize a series which looks like 1 plus x plus x squared, x to the third, etc., and which you can rewrite as 1 divided by 1 minus x. And if you do that, you'll find that the ratio between the output and the input field amplitudes is given by t squared into the phi divided by 1 minus r squared i phi, which you can rewrite with, for instance, t squared is capital T is 1 minus r, as this expression, 1 minus r e to the phi over 2, divided by 1 minus r e to the phi. And you see that the max maximum transmission of this phi baro cavity that comprises two mirrors is 1 minus r divided by 1 minus r is 1, say 100% transmission at phi is a multiple of 2 pi. So if the round trip pass fits is equal to a multiple, an integer multiple of the wavelength, then the transmission of the system as a whole, this question mark is indeed 100%. And that's the magic of interference. Whereas if the light doesn't fit, so if this phase is a multiple of 2 pi plus pi, then the minimum transmission amplitude absolute value is 1 minus r divided by 1 plus r. 
of course, the minimum intensity is the amplitude squared. So that's number squared. So looking back at the system, what we discussed is a fine parole interferometer comprises two mirrors, uh, two high reflecting mirrors, instant light, when it fits in the cavity, gets transmitted by 100%, whereas if it doesn't fit, the transmission is very low. And the reason for that is multiple interference of these round trip paths. As a result, the field builds up to enormous proportions. The field in between the two mirrors can be 100%, a factor 100 larger than the incident field, a factor 100 for the field propagating to the right, a factor 100 for the field propagating to the left, and a small fraction, 1% actually, of this light leaks out uh, such that the output intensity is equal to the input intensity. And that's the magic of interference in this fiber cavity. So now, let's look with an experimental eye at this system. Uh, there's at least two issues that you have to consider as an experimentalist. The first one is this mirror. What we sketch is an idealized mirror that transmits 1% and reflects 99%. So it's lossless. So mirrors, if there is a tiny bit of loss, this calculation might end up differently and the transmitted intensity is, of course, not as large as the input intensity. So we consider lossless mirrors and an actual mirror, of course, is not a slab, but has a finite thickness. So basically, what you consider is reflection of 99% on the front end, but at the back end of the mirror, you don't want any reflection. So what you should do, with, from an experimental point of view, is you should put a good AR anti-reflection coating at the back end. So you only have to consider the front end. So that's the first issue, mirrors. How good are the mirrors? The second issue that you might worry about is diffraction. Light is a wave. A wave uh, is diffracted, typically. So that means that if the beam has a finite diameter at the entrance, and if it bounces multiple times in between the mirrors, the actual pass lines can be quite long. And as a result, it might suffer from some diffraction goes round and round, the light spreads out slowly. So to deal with that issue, what you typically have is not a fiber row with plane mirrors to planar mirrors, but you typically have a fiber row with curved mirrors in such a way that the light that bounces up and down is somewhat curved, like the focus of a Gaussian beam. You also have to inject the light in a slight, weak focus. And in particular, uh, a very popular fire parole is the confocal fire parole interferometer. And confocal means that the foci of the two mirrors are on top of each other, confocal, which means that if the foci are on top of each other, the radius of curvature of these things um, is equal to the distance between the two mirrors. And that means that if you sketch an optical path in this system, and if you have a parallel beam going to the right, parallel beam gets focused in this point, that's what you call a focus, of course, <laughs> then it gets passes through the focus and turns into a parallel beam again. So you might say the, the light rays in a confocal fire parole look like a bow tie. But that, that's just a cute detail. So from an experimental point of view, again, quality of the mirrors is important. Lossless mirrors, good AR coating at the backside. And on the other hand, the planar fire parole is not that popular in the lab because of the fraction of light. So typically you use curved mirrors and the confocal power pro is a uh, special case thereof. So also the system that I started with, this fire pro, 
it has a curved mirror on the front, curved mirror on the back. I already mentioned that this thing contains the detector. I can uh, see what happens if I take it out and I think I will also remove the mirror with that. Let's have a look, yes. This is, this is one of the mirrors and this is the other mirror uh, with a lens to focus the light slightly onto uh, these mirror systems. And you might also have noticed this wire. This wire is uh, attached to a piezo element and this piezo element, if you put voltage on it, it expands. And this piezo element allows you to wiggle the uh, length of the cavity and that's very convenient because if you do that, then what you typically have, if you look at the transmission as a function of the length for a laser with a fixed wavelength, then for some length, the wavelength fits and you, for this ideal system, get 100% transmission. For other wavelengths, for other lengths, it doesn't fit. And so then you typically get a transmission like this as a function of the length of the cavity, where this distance is lambda over 2. So every time you modify the length a tiny bit uh, by lambda over 2, you re reach a point where the face fits again, the router face fits again into the cavity, is a multiple of 2 pi, this criteria. And that means that, for instance, if you have an optical source with two wavelengths, then one wavelength might fit at this length, another wavelength might fit at this length, and you can distinguish between wavelength lambda 1 and lambda 2 with very high resolution because the resolution is determined basically by how good things fit. So uh, uh, by this factor n, how many integer multiples of the wavelengths do fit in, and also by this quality of the fiber row. So if the length doesn't fit precisely, how quickly does this transmission drop from 100% to low values? And that quality of the fiber row is determined by the reflectivity. If you have a system with a high reflectivity, say 99%, then typically this width of this peak is also of the order of 1% uh, of the free spectral range. And actually, there is a factor by somewhere hidden, but that's a detail for now. So, fiber rows are often used to disentangle the optical spectrum of light. You have an optical source, you wonder what wavelengths are in that source, and for that, you transmit the light through a fiber row, you wiggle the mirrors around, you look at the transmission as a function of the distance between the mirrors, and from the transmission spectrum, uh, you can deduce the optical spectrum of the system with the uh, 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 yeah, disadvantage that things might overlap. So uh, that finishes my presentation of the fiber. Thank you for your attention.